So, so, ladies and gentlemen, fellow pirates, I would like to welcome you to the conference on the future of internet governance. I would like to welcome Linda Corojedo Stenenberg from the European Commission. Linda Corojedo was uh, head of the Swedish. Uh, thank you. Uh, head of the Swedish representative to the European Union, and currently she is a uh, director of resources in uh, ECOFIN. No. 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 <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm in DG Connect, um, dealing with the matters we are, are going to discuss today, and I'm Director of Cooperation. Yeah. Okay. Lapsus in the paper. And I would like to uh, welcome Julia Paul. Julia Paul from uh, Computer Science and Philosophy in Bremen, Bologna, and Berlin. Uh, currently, she is a Secretary and Member of the Steering Committee of the GigaNet, Global Internet Governance Academic Networks. A network, and since 2012, she served as the communication coordinator of the Emerging Scholar Network. Also, here is uh, Marice, Marice Schalke, a member of the European Parliament for the Netherlands, representing the group of Alliance of Liberal Democrats for Europe. And we have Richard Hill, the principal of Hill and Associates in Geneva, Switzerland, with extensive uh, background in information systems, telecommunications, negotiation, meditation, and conflict management. So, internet has become more than just an infrastructure for all of us today. Internet has almost become something that many of us cannot live anymore without it. And uh, the future of internet governance is not just a question of do we have um, all infrastructure needed for the future of economic and societal development. It, it's much more than that. We have two major conflicting positions whether the internet should be governed by states, the countries, the European Commission, or should we allow it only the private companies to, to set themselves, uh, for themselves uh, the minimal standards on how we should govern it. So uh, I will give words to Linda Corujego as our first speaker today. Thank you very much. Um, delighted to be here. Um, well, actually, the European Commission has a rather uh, clear position uh, because we have just released a communication in February, 12th of February, on Internet policy and governance. And uh, here we make it abundantly clear, I would like to say, that we are steadfast behind a strong and globally owned multi-stakeholder multi system. So this I want to be um, very, very firm about. We remain fully committed to this model for the governance of Internet, but we need to strengthen this model and make it more sustainable. And the window of opportunity might be closing if we do not act decisively now, and there is a concrete risk of political and ultimately technical fra fragmentation of the Internet, and you referred to that briefly in your introduction. Um, uh, yeah. So um, we are not making any sort of clear links between what has been going on with surveillance and internet governance. But uh, on the other hand, this is a reality surrounding us. And um, uh, whatever might be the case, the trust in the global in internet, including its technical architecture and governance, has received a blow. Um, there is, as I said, um, a real risk that this might lead to political, legal, and ultimately technical fragmentation of the global Internet, and this must be avoided at all costs. And there have been more events, by the way, who, who has made this situation so, so, uh, so poignant right now, and that was also the failure in Dubai 2012 to reach uh, an agreement on, on a new set of ITRs or, or a treaty for, for in, in the context of ITU, because here a split became very, very clear between those who supported the multi-stakeholder model on the one side and on the other side, uh, some countries who would want to see more of a top-down uh, control of the Internet. So uh, we think that top-down um, is not the right answer. Uh, we do not call for new legal instruments, and we do not want the UN or the ITU to take over. Uh, what we need to put forward um, instead is an evolutionary path for a sustainable evolution of the Internet and its governance. Um, we must move forward towards real globalization of, of key Internet functions. 
And of course, uh, here I'm thinking I can Aniana, and here we have the recent statement, the last, last weekend actually, last late Friday night, Saturday morning, our time, uh, the Department of Commerce declared that they were prepared to let go of the control of, uh, of the Aniana function, but that it should take place in an orderly function. Uh, fashion, and they also said that it must address four principles, and those four principles I will read out to you. Support and enhance the multi-stakeholder model, maintain the security, stability, and resilience of the Internet domain name system, meet the needs and expectations of the global customers and partners of IANA services, and maintain the openness of the Internet. So what we need to do is to work towards a coherent set of Internet principles which safeguard an open and fragmented Internet with full respect for human rights. And actually the Commission, apart from its communication, we have also sent inputs to the forthcoming conference in Sao Paulo in Brazil, the 23rd and 24th of April, so quite soon next month actually. And here we, we, we stress these principles and, and there is also a more practical roadmap on what, what should happen. So the NET Mondial, as this conference is called, can be an important occasion to move forward. And we need to take the political responsibility to make sure that this conference will lead to concrete results and timetables would also be good. So that's the roadmap, roadmap I, I referred to. And we do think that we need to engage as Europe. And so uh, we are uh, discussing with the member states our own communication. And we are also discussing with the member states a line to take for the EU um, in, in Sao Paulo. So that work is, is going on right now. Um, so I think I'll stop here because this is the latest that I had to tell you. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Linda and I would like to ask uh, Mr. Richard Hill with his extensive uh, experience in mediation and negotiations. What do, you, what do you expect what will become of the next month conference in Brazil? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to answer that. I'm not now. I'll answer it at the end. Actually, you'll be able to answer it at the end. Yesterday, Rick Faltwinger gave us a very inspiring talk on what the internet should be. And I hope that all of us here share that vision. I'm going to focus on the dark side, what the internet actually is, and how bad it's going to become if we keep doing what we're doing now. That is, if we let private companies dominate the decisions and governments take certain actions or don't take certain actions, including democratic governments. I saw on the news this morning that Turkey has shut down Twitter after a court order. Now, no doubt that will be overturned by the European uh, Court of Human Rights in due course, but that's some years away. And I also saw on the news that in the extradition hearings of Kim.com from New Zealand to the United States, uh, Kim doesn't get to look at the evidence that the U.S. will use when they actually get him in the U.S. to try him. So democratic countries are taking actions or not taking actions, and so are European countries, and I'm sorry, so is the European Commission from my point of view. And I know these things because I've worked both for the private companies and for the governments. Rick reminded us that companies will defend their status quo in order to protect their business models and their profitability. This is normal. Companies are there to make money. If they have a business model, they will stick to it. And they'll use narratives to convince everybody that what they're doing is right. Now, everybody here knows the copyright narrative. Copyright violation is theft. I don't think anybody here believes that, but that's the narrative, and we see it every time we look at a movie, don't we? That narrative is perhaps a myth. There's another narrative on patents, which you've all heard. We need patents to have innovation. Well, for sure, patents create innovation, but Fleming didn't need a patent to do penicillin. There are not very many patents on the net, and there are not very many patents regarding the GSM network. So you can have innovation without a strong patent system. So what are the narratives about internet governance? We heard one, we need the multi-stakeholder model. I'll come back to that. It's about protecting freedom of speech. Well, actually it isn't. If you want to protect sp freedom of speech, you have to work on something other than the internet. I'll come back to that. It's about protecting the de decentralized model or not being top-down, as we just heard. 
Well, that's actually not true because if you look at another technology like GSM, it's actually grown faster than the Internet and is more widely available than the Internet. And actually, we've been discussing the same issues on the Internet for the past 20 years, and I'll outline what those are. The multi-stakeholder model has two variations. Nobody doubts and nobody disputes that you should consult everybody when making decisions. This is normal. That's not what's being argued about. What's being argued about is whether companies, private companies, and civil society should have equal status with governments when making decisions. It kind of sounds good. Why not? You know, these are people affected. Why shouldn't they have equal status? Well, because if they have equal status, they can veto change. Do you really want incumbent telecommunication operators to make decisions on net neutrality? Because that's what we're talking about. Do you really want the private companies that are monetizing our data to make decisions on data privacy and data protection? That's what we're talking about. So actually, this is an extremely important debate, which has nothing to do with ICANN anymore. It started with ICANN, but it goes way beyond that. It's about geopolitical and geoeconomic domination by one country, and I don't have any problems naming it. I renounced my citizenship in the United States some time ago. This is about keeping the Internet free and open. Open for innovation, that is not allowing private companies to dominate it and create fenced walls and gardens and enclosures. And it's about keeping it free from the abuse of dominant power, both by private companies and by governments. So let's take a little bit of a look at the issues. Why do I say that freedom of speech is not really an Internet governance issue? Because everybody accepts that offline rights apply online. Now, that may be a surprise to some people, and you think that that was only embodied in a recent UN resolution, but actually that goes back to about 1870, when a judge in the U.S. said that, yes, a telegram is a proper way of forming contracts. If you look at the legal literature, there is no doubt whatsoever that offline rights apply online. The problem is that you're allowed to restrict freedom of speech offline and therefore to allow it online. Just take a look at, uh, at paragraph 2 of Article 19, of the Convention on Civil and Political Rights, and it says that you can restrict freedom of speech to respect, respect the rights of others, that's copyright, and to protect national security and the public order and public health and morals. So if we're serious about freedom of speech, we have to go and change the fundamental instruments of freedom of speech, not say offline rights apply online. It's the same as copyright. If you want to fix copyright on the internet, you have to fix fundamental copyright law. You can't just say we want copyright law to apply to the Internet. That's exactly what we don't want. We want to change the copyright law. The other narrative is the Internet is decentralized. Sure, the infrastructure is decentralized. It's actually decentralized exactly the same way the telephone infrastructure is because I think everybody here is technical enough that you know these are actually the same infrastructure now. There isn't any separate infrastructure. The services are highly centralized. Search engines are very centralized. Email is very centralized. And that's not just me saying that. I just have here an article from the MIT Tech Review which says the business has been developed in a very centralized way. Those businesses are built around centralizing information on their servers. That's Twitter, that's Facebook, that's whatever. And that's our fault. We didn't have to do that. But we let them centralize it. And why do we let them centralize it? Because it looks like it's free. I can get a Facebook account for free. I can get Gmail for free. But it's not free, is it? What are you giving them in exchange for the service? You're giving them information. The information that you're giving them is worth much more than the service they're providing to you. And that's obvious because they're highly profitable. So you have to keep that in mind. Those organizations will wish to maintain their business model, which is to collect all the world's information, monetize it, and use it to sell targeted advertising. Rick made the analogy to oil. Uh, sorry, it wasn't Rick. It was uh, one of the other speakers. That's correct. Information and data is today's petroleum industry. And the horizontal and vertical domination of that industry by big players is far greater than anything you ever saw in the oil era. The old oil companies never had as such a dominant power over their industry as some of the information companies have today. I'm not the only one saying these things. Who here knows Eben Moglen? Mm -hmm. Of course, Jake knows, okay? Yes. Everybody who doesn't know him, please go look at him. He speaks about these things. He speaks about copyright. 
Uh, he speaks about data privacy. He speaks about government surveillance. And I'm sure that everybody here will resonate with what uh, Edmund has to say. Another narrative you'll hear is, it's working great, do no harm, don't change it. Well, it's not working great. If you have a patient bleeding to death, you have to intervene. Now, why do I say it's bleeding to death? Well, we've been discussing the same issues for 20 years, but I'll go back only 10 years because that's where they were first documented formally. Who's heard of the Working Group on Internet Governance? Okay, not very many people. So that was a body created, a multi-stakeholder body, and that one was equal footing, uh, to discuss the issues that were bothering people since 1998. That's when these issues started bothering people, and to sort of write them up and suggest solutions. Well, the three issues that they identified, they identified a lot of issues. The key three issues that they identified uh, were actually, one of them was just mentioned by our friend from the European Commission, the asymmetric role of the U.S. government. If we don't want governments running the Internet, why do we have the U.S. government running the Internet? Good question. Security and spam, that was the second issue. And the third issue, which doesn't affect Europe directly but does affect it indirectly, is the relatively high cost of the Internet in developing countries. It can be between 10 and 100 times more expensive to access the Internet in developing countries than it is here. And by the way, that's not true of GSM. GSM prices in relative terms, they're still higher but not by such a dramatic level. Now, if you look at the inputs to Brazil, which I have, I actually have a, done an analysis of all 187 contributions, 10 years later, what are the issues? Exactly the same. So how's the multi-stakeholder model been working? We still have the U.S. government, and by the way, if you look at what they said now, it's exactly what they said in 1997 in the White Paper. In 1997 in the White Paper, they said, we want to get out of managing uh, the Internet, let somebody make a proposal. That's what they just said. We want to get out. Let somebody make a proposal. Security, <coughs> no improvement. Spam is getting worse. You see less spam because the filters are good, but now I'm getting false positives. Just the other week, I sent a message to Julia Reda, and it comes back spam blocked. Why? It's got nothing to do with me. It's my ISP is on the blockage list of her ISP. Who knows why? Privacy and surveillance, we didn't talk about that 10 years ago. That's a big issue now. So on the security area, we've clearly gone backwards. The cost of, for developing countries, there's been no progress, and now we have cost issues in the developed countries because of the resistance to net neutrality. And you know that the proposal in front of the, made by the European Commission and in front of the Parliament uh, and the Council is to actually allow an exception to net neutrality, which I can't resist adding is exactly the proposal that the Europeans criticized fiercely when it was brought into the wicket. <laughs> Maritza will remember that. Outcry that Etna would bring that proposal to the ITU, but somehow it slips in and the Commission presents it to the Parliament. So we're not progressing. I'm sure everybody here remembers Star Wars, the movie. And I forget which movie it is in, but there's a scene when Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda are rather depressed. And one of them says, but there is hope. Well, I think the hope is here in this room with the pirates and in this institution. Because I think the only institution that has a chance of actually tackling the real issues is the European parliaments. Thank you. Uh, I would like to give word to uh, uh, Julia Paul. Uh, what do you think, what is the real role of the Parliament and the Commission in these negotiations? I will just write, uh, I'll just read one short uh, sentence from the paper called Internet Governance and the Domain Name System by Leonard Kruger for the U U.S. Congress. It said, the key issue for the 130th Congress is whether and how the U.S. government should continue to maximize U.S. influence over ICANN's multi-stakeholder internet governance process, while at the same time effectively resisting proposals for an increased role by international governmental institutions such as the United Nations. An ongoing concern is to what extent will future intergovernmental telecommunication conferences uh, work to counteract that threat. So we have threat, we have... Uh, key issue that is basically remaining the status quo or status as it is. Oh, thank you. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Um, 
I will try to answer your question uh, why the end. Uh, but first, um, as I'm here as a member of the, the academic community, uh, which is a stakeholder in internet governance too, um, I would like to do what academics are normally supposed to do and take a bit of distance uh, and try to question a few things. And what I would like to question is actually what you had in your introduction and which was repeated uh, by my first, uh, the first two speakers, which is that we have currently an opposition of two different visions of internet governance. Uh, which at the Wicked Conference was also described as some kind of a digital cold war between two different blocks. Uh, so these two blocks um, I actually described as one being like ostensibly in favor of a free, open, human right-based uh, and multi-stakeholder governed internet. And then the second block would be um, the nasty countries who try to wrestle away the control of the internet and introduce censorship, surveillance and control. And I think this, this analogy and this uh, Cold War rhetoric is very misleading and it's very dangerous. Uh, and I think it, the situation is not that simple. It's not two blocks. Uh, it's much more complex. And when I look at it, I see rather four different kind of, of models of internet governance which we have uh, around. And in order to, to somehow understand them and visualize them, I can think it's, for me, it's like a triangle. So you have a triangle in one corner, you have this intergovernmental approach, which really tries to have a traditional governmental uh, decision-making process in internet governance. On one corner, you have more disabilitarian approach, uh, which uh, consists in an unrestricted uh, self-governance uh, by users, the technical community, and so on. And in the third corner, you have the private sector-led approach, uh, which is the idea in its extreme to have like the total privatization of all internet functions uh, without any governmental or any other control. And then we have a fourth vision, uh, which is currently the only discussed alternative or the only uh, somehow plausible solution uh, which we come up with, uh, which is the multi-stakeholder model, which is in its ideal version situated in the middle of the other three, uh, with all pulling, trying to pull in their directions. Um, so I think the opposition that we have is actually not only opposition between countries who try to have more influence, like intergovernmental influence on internet governance, but I think on the other side we actually have those who wittingly or unwittingly try to, to neglect the fact that the model we currently have is not this ideal version of, of multi-stakeholderism that we propagate. It's actually much more close to the, the private sector-led corner. Uh, so we are much more close to a privatization uh, and a private sector-led internet governance model than many of us would like to accept. Um, so this is the opposition that we, we actually have. Um, and I think this somehow, the, 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 the Snowden revelations, but many other elements in the last one and a half years uh, led to uh, of some way um, understanding by many actors that the model we have, the model we defend, is actually not the model um, that we believe in. So what, the, what we currently see is that a number of events, but also commission, I hope Marike will speak of one of the commissions which was recently created, uh, but as well the event which will take place next, next month in, in, um, in April, in April, sorry, in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, will try to question why we are so far from the model we propagate. And I think one of the main reasons, there are many, many reasons, but one of the main reasons is actually the, the privileged role of the United States within the current um, system. And so there are many attempts to question this, this particular role uh, and the, the announcement of the United States government last week um, to hand over the oversight of IANA Frank Chance to the global multi-stakeholder community. Uh, it's just a way to anticipate the critiques they will get in the, the next and the upcoming events. But I think what we, sh well, I, and I think this discussion about how we can actually try to replace the oversight by the U.S. government, uh, and I can, how we can replace it, will definitely dominate the, the, the upcoming debates uh, until September 2015, which was the deadline the U.S. Uh, the U.S. government gave. But even beyond, because I'm not sure if there will be found a solution until this date, it would be very surprising. Um, but we shouldn't forget, and all this, that actually resolving this one tiny little problem, which is the UN oversight over IANA function, will not solve the problem we have in internet governance nowadays. And actually, it will only even pull it more into the corner of the private sector-led governance model, uh, because it will increase the privatization of core internet functions. Uh, so if we want to have a multi-stakeholder model, uh, we try, have to try to pull it as well in the other two corners. Not only the intergovernmental model, but also the, the more civilitarian model with uh, giving users increasingly more influence. 
Because if we don't do this, and I, yeah, I fully, um, fully agree with uh, my, the other two speakers, if we don't do this, uh, we risk that at some point there will be no global internet to be governed. Uh, but there will be uh, many regional and national internets which will all be governed in a different way following a different model. Thanks. Ah, sorry, the role of the, United, uh, the, the European Commission. <laughs> well, I think uh, the European Commission, the role should be this, uh, to really try to, to, to make the multi-stakeholder model uh, more global, not more private, but really more global uh, by integrating all different stakeholders on an equal footing, as it's called. Yeah. Okay, uh, before we continue, I would like to also ask another question to Linda Corujego, Corujedo, uh, about the role of uh, European Commission in uh, current uh, internet governance process of uh, negotiation with the United States. Because, uh, as uh, Julia mentioned, uh, it is not only about the ICANN. Uh, all the major companies that are registered, established in the United States, abide on the United States corporate laws and all other laws that entitle to their, their ownership. So basically, all United States uh, laws concerning the internet governance, data protection, everything, is the only basic standard that they need to abide, especially in some special services like cloud, that are not physically here in the European Union. What is the position of Commission about that issue and how will it be negotiated? Well, first of all, our position is that not only, not only IANA, but also ICANN should be globalized or internationalized, so precisely because it's, it's not, uh, we think, a good state of things today when the Internet is so global that it's actually homed in, in one particular country. So, so there we are very clear. And I absolutely agree that ICANN is not all, that's for sure. Um, Julia is absolutely right about that. There is a lot of other things going on. There is the IGF, for instance, where we want to see it strengthened. And we want um, the work of the IGF to give, give more concrete output, because f for now it's actually been more speaking than, than actually advancing. So, so that's very, very clear. And w to be also very clear, we absolutely do not want to outsource uh, lawmaking, which is a duty of governments to, to private business. Absolutely not. And that's why we say that the multi-stakeholder model must be strengthened, so that all actors in the model must have their roles more clarified in order for things to, to work better. This, this is the issue. And uh, now I will give the word to Ms. Uh, Marietje. Yes. <laughs> Marietje, a uh, member of the European Parliament from the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my party is a progressive liberal party, and I uh, must confess I have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with pirate parties for the <laughs> following reason. Um, it's my personal ambition uh, that uh, my country doesn't need a pirate party because I would like my own party to incorporate all those topics in such a way uh, that that covers uh, what's needed. <clears throat> but of course, um, I want to uh, uh, invite every one of you to be and to stay politically active, whether it's in elected offices or not. Um, uh, sometimes uh, I know this is a challenge. We had local elections in the Netherlands this Wednesday and uh, I don't think the pirate party uh, managed to get a seat. They almost did in Amsterdam and I thought they would. Oh, they got it? Oh, good, sorry. It was depending on the details that I hadn't seen it. Well, congratulations. Uh, I'm very happy with that. I think that that, no, I think it's great. Um, <laughs> but even for all the other people who, who were not uh, uh, elected, um, I think it is essential that your kind of knowledge, knowledge about technology, uh, gets fed into the political process and vice versa, that uh, there is an awareness of what politics uh, does uh, to impact the things that you uh, care about. Basically, if you don't shape it, um, you know, policies, it will shape uh, your lives. Uh, in this parliament, I'm focusing mostly on foreign affairs, on international trade with fund dossiers like ACTA, for example, which we managed to uh, get rid of. Uh, but I also work on issues related to um, culture and media and education through technology like copyright reform, uh, net neutrality, which we're in a last-ditch fight, and I 
hopeful that we can bend it back uh, to uh, uh, safeguard net neutrality in Europe as well, as we managed to do in the Netherlands. Um, and it was uh, briefly hinted at before, I'm also a member of this um, Internet Governance Commission with quote unquote experts from various places in the world, which I don't know much about yet, uh, because the first meeting uh, still has to take place and it will take place in Sweden uh, at the end of May. But I'll be happy to uh, stay in touch about what, uh, what happens there and uh, uh, will do my best to inject uh, digital freedoms as a key issue of internet governance. Uh, in my introductory remarks, though, I want to basically focus on the, what I think uh, is important to keep in mind, which is that Internet governance is about much more than Internet governance. Um, this may sound a bit strange, perhaps, but uh, I think the institutionalized formal platforms for Internet governance are only a small part of where decisions are made and that there is political decisions, uh, but also market developments uh, on a daily basis that impact uh, the lives of internet users, um, etc., etc., uh, without being labeled as internet governance. So it doesn't suffice simply to debate uh, what will happen in Brazil or what will happen at the Internet Governance Forum of the UN and then think that anything related to internet governance is covered. I think it is about the relationship between states and individuals in a hyper connected world or uh, on the internet. And states will have or consider to have um, constitutional responsibilities about uh, protecting people and the country, about preserving competition, uh, and should care uh, most about safeguarding individual rights and freedoms. Uh, but how to ensure this uh, in, in a hyper-connected world is, I think, the key challenge that we're facing. Uh, how to ensure there is democratic oversight, transparency, uh, etc., are, are really the key questions out there. And all these have to be answered uh, without over-regulating. Now, as I mentioned, I think on the one hand, there are sort of organic developments that are not labeled internet governance, where laws are made, decisions are taken that impact uh, people when they're using the internet. Um, for example, the privatization of information, of policing on the internet, uh, decisions around net neutrality, around data protection, around surveillance, etc., etc. I mean, the list is really endless. And then there are the more institutional platforms at the United Nations, the ITU in Brazil, at Eurodig, all kinds of different international platforms that often don't have uh, legally binding uh, decisions. Uh, the EU should, I think, play a leading role, especially now that the US has uh, a credibility problem, in um, uh, seeking to ensure people's digital freedoms uh, in this world, so not only of our own citizens, but beyond. And the European Commission has made a proposal recently in which it confirms that it believes the open internet should be preserved and the multi-stakeholder model should as well. Now, I think the multi-stakeholder model is one of the most vague and also most um, misplaced words oftentimes because it seems a medicine for all diseases. If you ask what should we do about internet governance, not rarely do people say, well, we just need the multi-stakeholder model. Um, and a lot of people have no idea what it means or think about different things when they hear it, so it should be more filled in with more detail and uh, should certainly become more inclusive and uh, uh, in-depth. The Commission also proposes um, to do more research, to open up a website that makes clear all kinds of initiatives around internet governance, and it has indeed called for the internationalization of ICANN, which uh, now carefully seems to, or slowly seems to uh, happen. All in all, it's very much about seeking new norms or quote-unquote normative framework, which in turn has a lot to do with values. Uh, and I think that here we touch upon uh, some challenges because, as I, uh, as I mentioned, um, regardless of internet governance platforms, governments will make decisions that impact people's lives. In Russia, we know there are laws adopted that legally allow for deep packet inspection uh, at all times, often, of course, uh, under the banner of national security. There's mass censorship in China. Uh, Turkey banned Twitter yesterday by, uh, by a political decree. And the list of such measures that governments are taking as we speak uh, or have taken over the past years that deeply impact Internet and its governance is very, very long. Um, of course, another key player are the companies that are in the business of making money. Uh, and I think that too often they are 
like the new sovereigns. Uh, in discussions that we have or that I, that I have with different people, especially those who know a lot about the technologies uh, related to the Internet, there is a, a plea not to over-regulate the Internet. And I certainly agree that we must be very, very careful what kind of rules we put in place. I'm a liberal politically. I, I don't like rules. I don't like heavy government. Uh, but I do think that people's rights and freedoms and some other principles have to be protected. We also have legitimate questions concerning security uh, as long as they are not used to uh, restrict freedom in some kind of zero-sum game. But in the absence of regulation, in areas where there's a vacuum of regulation, we should also seriously ask ourselves who benefits and is that status quo acceptable? Uh, and then how should it change? So key challenges when it comes to internet governance are the reality of the territorial aspects uh, or the nation state's role in, uh, in making laws or treaties or agreements and, and how they are binding and enforceable vis-a-vis -vis this hyper -connective, uh, connected world. Um, <clears throat> key question is, I think, really how to protect some very fundamental issues like people's fundamental rights and freedoms, but also like competition, how to ensure that there is oversight, preferably democratic, um, and how there are checks and balances and transparency. And for all these questions, uh, knowledge is really needed. And I cannot emphasize enough how difficult it is, also in this parliament, to uh, make relevant decisions about the issues before us, such as net neutrality right now, but many, many other issues in the past, when there is really a lack of, of sufficient understanding of what technologies are already capable of and how they are used in practice. And I think that if in the United States more decision makers would have known more about the potential of certain technologies, it would have potentially allowed them to, to play a, a better role in ensuring oversight um, and uh, we may be in a different place right now, and I'm sure the same goes for uh, the EU. But knowing where we are now, again, I think it's true that the EU should and can play a role of leadership, whether it's in Internet governance or protecting people's rights uh, on and offline in the rest of the world. Thanks. Thank you. I would like to use the time that we have left for the questions and debate among the audience. So, please, raise your hands if you have an answer. The lady in the last row. Thank you. My name is Karine Ifour. I work for IEEE. I'm not at all from the Pirate Party. And, uh, but I have a lot of sympathy. I would like to know the reaction of um, the panel on the different uh, type of regulation governance that have been uh, talked recently about the difference between internet uh, gov uh, governance of the internet and governance on the internet. Thank you very much. Mr. Hill. I, I, I like a lot what uh, Maritza said. It's not so simple, and there's a lot of obfuscation going around, and the obfuscation is sometimes accidental, people actually don't know, and sometimes deliberate from certain interests. Um, you know, for example, you mentioned that uh, from an economic point of view, you're a liberal. Actually, so am I. I'm not liberal for other things, but economically, I am. And the the purpose of a liberal uh, economic regime is to foster competition. So the question is, are there areas where there cannot be competition? Natural monopolies, you're familiar with that. So from my point of view, I strongly believe that it, infrastructure is a natural monopoly. So not only does net neutrality make sense, net neutrality is actually just a band-aid. You have to if you take the full step. You have to accept that some basic level of pipes is a public good which must be provided to everybody at a fixed price. We're nowhere near that debate yet. But that's a debate that at some point has to take place. So you see, of the Internet, on the Internet, what is the Internet anyway? Is the Internet the web or is the Internet the pipes? So we have to really distinguish this very complex uh, set of activities and decide what we want to do. In some areas we should be hands-off where there can be competition. In other areas, we should not be hands-off, either because there are fundamental values involved, such as privacy, or security for that matter, or because there cannot be competition. Mr.
Ms. Linda would like to answer. Well, I would actually like to get back to one point that Mr. Hill made. And um, you claim that uh, the proposal on the table uh, in Parliament now uh, from, the, from the Commission on net neutrality is the same as some developing countries presented in Dubai. Did I understand you correctly? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm all, at all times wanting to stay polite. But I have to say that I regard this as a misdescription of the proposal on the table. What we what we have proposed is something to deal with the fact that there are no rules now, so a lot of throttling and blocking is going on of the internet, and that means that not all consumers are in the same position, and this has to be dealt with. What we're asking for is good coverage for all citizens, but there is a proposal about a plus service for uh, for instance, hospitals who would perform operations online, they have to be sure that, that the quality is, is the best that there is, and then they would have to pay for it. That's the only thing. And that, I cannot see how that relates to, to what was presented in Dubai. Yes, of course, Mr. Hill. Uh, you're right, it's a little bit more complicated. It's not related to what was presented in Dubai, but it's practically identical to what Etno presented in the preparatory process leading up to Dubai. Well, we can discuss that offline, and you can read all about it in my book uh, on the Wicked, and you'll see that it actually is extremely similar uh, proposal. Ms. Merecha. Well, it's also a fact that the last word about net neutrality has not been said. Uh, the Parliament has to vote um, on it in a couple of weeks, and we will. And I'm hopeful that there will be more clarity where there is clarity needed, and uh, that there will be uh, a strong proposal for enshrining net neutrality in EU law. And I mean actual net neutrality, not what has been presented as net neutrality before. All in all, we have to be careful that we don't protect vested interests um, at the expense of preserving the principle of net neutrality. I think that that's where the fundamental fight um, is. Then on uh, governance of Internet, uh, I agree. I think at one point the discussion will be about whether the Internet should be treated as a utility that everyone should has, have access to. It also comes into play when people call for access to the Internet as quote-unquote human right, which has happened uh, in my political party before, uh, and what that means for the role of government. And we're not there yet, but I think that those uh, questions will be asked. But what I think is fundamentally important and what is, what is often a challenge is to make sure that whenever technologies are discussed or developed or researched or uh, built, that the persons who will be impacted by these technologies are kept in mind. And so I think we should go to uh, a place where human rights impact assessments are made much more early when it comes to the development of technologies because too often we're running behind the ball. Something is developed with a specific purpose in mind, happens to have side effects or collateral effects, and only because we find out that, for example, facial recognition is not great in a dictatorship, um, then, you know, uh, there is an attempt to take action. And it's too late oftentimes. So um, I think that that tension, too, is one that we should keep in mind that in the end, we're talking about people. Uh, that's also the role of governments to ensure that people's lives uh, and development can happen in a safe and free way at least in democracies, uh, and that should also be re-evaluated in light of rapidly developing technologies. Thank you. And I would also like to add one, questions, uh, one question. So soon we'll have a decision of European Parliament concerning internet governance. Uh, how do you presume that will have an effect on current negotiations with the United States on a free trade agreement? Well, I don't know if we'll have a um, text on internet governance. I've proposed a debate and a, and a resolution, uh, but there was not yet enough support by the other political groups for that, which is a bit surprising because I think the European Parliament should speak out about uh, the sort of mandate or the mission with which the EU and the member states go to the meeting in Brazil uh, and beyond. But um, I'll probably draft a letter which I'll send around for members to sign so that we can at least um, share our views. But generally speaking, um, I think the uh, negotiations on trade and investment um, with the United States have been heavily impacted by the NSA revelations. Of course, when you are operating 
as uh, quote unquote allies. It assumes a level of trust, um, and uh, you know, for example, in the way in which there is no distinction between how European citizens uh, are um, under surveillance uh, versus those of other countries, doesn't doesn't indicate that there is an alliance in practice. Of course, uh, all kinds of revelations regarding the tapping of, of Chancellor Merkel and others uh, have led to uh, a shock and. Uh, uh, well, very uh, strong words also by European governments. But uh, I'm afraid that a lot of our own governments are engaged in similar activities. Uh, some of it we know about, some of it we don't know about. Uh, so if anything, this should lead to a discussion about what it means to be a democracy in today's day and age. I think it really touches upon the very fundamentals of the claims of democracy, of what's been written in the US Constitution, and how it's not lived up to uh, in practice. On the other hand, we should not be naive about how these revelations have also led to what I think is an unholy alliance of countries who want to now seek to nationalize the internet for various reasons. And I very much understand the reactions uh, to the NSA revelations. I think we should find um, uh, actual safeguards to protect internet users the world over, but the solutions like nationalizing the internet, which uh, countries have, have put forward, are in my uh, opinion making matters worse instead of better. Uh, and so we have to also look at who, uh, who benefits uh, in this uh, heavily politicized discussion um, and how we can ensure that, that we're looking at the right issues to solve. Uh, and so in the transatlantic trade and investment partnership negotiations, which um, I lead um, the oversight over for the liberal group, we're continuing with the technical work, but we have said that we want this trust to be restored uh, before we're able to, um, uh, to deal with uh, the finalized text of the trade agreement. And I'm sure that's what our publics will ask for, and that's why it's good that this parliament has a decisive say in trade agreements. Uh, it was also the reason why we could reject ACTA, which was presented as a trade agreement, uh, which in my opinion was a law enforcement agreement, but that's a whole different discussion. Um, in other words, this parliament has a say, so if you have concerns about uh, TTIP, the Trade and Investment Partnership, by all means let us know, uh, and we'll try to, uh, to address them. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. Mr. Interdor was first. I'm Simon Phipps. I'm from the Open Rights Group in the UK. Um, the discussion around net neutrality has focused on traffic prioritization. Uh, the events that are happening in Turkey show that governments are willing to obstruct the free flow of traffic for political reasons as well. Uh, in particular in the UK, I'm aware that uh, ISPs in the UK have been told to use deep packet inspection techniques and to make available the ability to completely block the internet for political reasons with very little governance. I wonder whether you believe sufficient is being done for the protection of democracy and the free flow of ideas in these net neutrality regulations or whether you believe they focus too much on the, the commercial needs of lobbyists. Whoever would like to answer, but yes, you. Yeah. Um, I think there is, no, I think there's a lot of lobbying going on, and I, I also think there's a lot of misunderstanding. I think that's the main challenge, to make people understand what net neutrality is and why it is important. And we should see this in the context of a telecoms package where, for example, uh, taking away roaming charges is the, by far the most easily understandable and also the most politically attractive. I mean, of course I want to tell my voters, uh, look what we've been up to for the past couple of years. Uh, in a few years you don't have to pay these ridiculous charges anymore. So that's the context that we also have to look at. It's, it's a broader package than just net neutrality. Uh, but it's been my focus throughout that we must not forget the public value of the internet and to preserve its open nature, but also the public value. And not just to look at competition aspects, innovation aspects, entry to the market, uh, incumbents versus newcomers, etc., but to really also look at that public value. And I think uh, that that is a decisive argument, but it does relate to issues like allowing for innovation, allowing for startups to also enter the market, etc., uh, allowing for access to information, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a part of the discussion, but probably not the most um, visible one. 
Mr. Hill would also like to reply. Yeah, actually, I'm a freedom of expression hawk because I do believe in the American version, which is basically you can say anything. It's actually worse than you said in the UK. As you know, ISPs now block pornography uh, unless you explicitly ask the pornography not be blocked. And I don't think that actually went through Parliament, and it certainly didn't go to referendum, which if we'd had it in Switzerland, it would have been soundly defeated, of course, because people should be able to access these things. There hasn't been a lot of talk about that, no. And the reason is because it goes back to the fundamental instruments on human rights, which basically say countries can do what they like. It says they have to have a law. Okay, that's easy. You pass a law. But the law can say, well, public morale in the UK is that we shouldn't have pornography. And then what are you going to do about it? Okay, in Europe, you can challenge it at the European Court of Human Rights, and you have a chance. Elsewhere, what can you do? You can't do anything. And I think we have to move that debate up. I don't think we want offline rights equal online rights. I think we want more rights online. And that's a completely different debate, which nobody's having. And we're not having it because it's a difficult debate. We're also not having it because it doesn't suit the people who make money out of the status quo. Never forget that. People make money out of the status quo. These people don't want anything to be discussed. Just one thing. It's easier to preserve the status quo than to change things. Okay, we have another question. For the last, uh, Angelo Skarlaftis, good evening, everybody, uh, from Epaphos Advisors, but also here as an observer of the Echo Waves movement. Uh, I would like uh, to say that uh, the Internet doesn't belong to, but only to the, Europe, to the American Army. The American Army, through a non-profitable organization, controls the Internet. So our proposal for the last six years, and we hope that the pirates are going to, to uh, support our proposal, uh, is to, to build the CNET, the European the European aspect uh, perspective of the Internet, because we, do, we cannot ever uh, have a multi-stakeholder option. They are trying this 20 years and the United States denies. The Internet is controlled by a, a simple protocol, for those who know about technical issues, uh, the TCP IP, mainly uh, by the uh, American authorities. So only if we, the Europeans, we are going to build our option of the internet, the CNET as it is our proposal, and we, we need only the universities and non-governmental organizations instead of the American option, which is the army and the uh, corporations. Uh, only in this way we can have our own governance, which is also very near to the liberal ideas, because the liberals, they like competition. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, last question, please, Mr. Thank you. My name is Björn Flintberg, Swedish Pirate Party, also on the Education Committee of the Swedish Pirate Party. Um, a little bit of continuation of that, and also going back to what the, our Honourable Member of Parliament said before, uh, the discussion that I came up in her party on regarding the Internet as a technological infrastructure versus a human right. I, th I, I see, and I would like the response of the panel on that, that the... As beautiful as it sounds with the multi-stakeholder model, it cannot encompass all the various stakeholders simply because it is not simply just a, a set of technological structures anymore. It now contains and influences all aspects of our lives, uh, education, um, school books, traveling, um, banking, purchases, etc. So it's sort of a fragmented, decentralized structure which affects everything that we do. And we should, we, we talk a lot in Sweden about not seeing the internet as something separate from the rest of our lives, but something integrated into it. And, and so to me, the, the multi-stakeholder model isn't, isn't really true for every other type of legislation that we have regarding our children's needs or our schools or our taxation. We don't let the companies become a part of that, at least not on a legislative level. They can advise and have ideas and have lobbyism all they want, but making the laws and, and creating the laws for the global community, um, we leave out a huge portion of the people who should be involved. Uh, and so I see a challenge there with the multi-stakeholder model, and I'd like the panel's response to that. Mr. Hill? Yeah, that's exactly what I've, um, since I left the ITU last year, now I can finally say what I think, as opposed to having to say what I'm supposed to say. Uh, and that's been most of my writing now. Um, uh, you'll find it on my webpage. And I'm making a longer intervention at four with the young pirates, and I gave them a bibliography. That's the whole point. The multi-stakeholder model, we said it needs clarity. Well, I'm sorry, it was clarified. 
It's in the Tunis Agenda in 2005. And I think it says something very reasonable. It says what you said. When it's a matter of public policy, the governments have to make the decisions. Hopefully they're democratic. Maybe they're not, but that's a different problem. Technical matters, we don't want governments. I fully agree. I'm a liberal. That's the last thing we want. Let private companies do that. The academics should be involved and so on. So the roles were defined there. But that's being challenged now. People are saying exactly what you said shouldn't be done. They're saying, well, no, wait a minute. Private companies should have the same rights as governments to make decisions. Well, we don't want that for copyright. It already happens too much. The lobbies are too strong. You know that. Maritza said kind things about the U.S. Sorry, I can't support that. The U.S. is no longer a democracy. Anybody who's American knows that. For, forget the U.S. It's just the lobby's driving policy. And to come to your answer, why don't we have competition on the root files? That's been proposed. It's technically feasible. It would not fragment the Internet. All you'd have to do is say, I want the ICANN root, or I want the XYZ root. Why not? Mr. Maricha. No, I was just curious. Maybe I missed something, but I don't think I said too many nice things about the United States in my introductory <laughs> remarks. But um, I think there are still some good principles in the U.S. Constitution, for example, on free speech. But they have to be lived by. I mean, you can write down all kinds of nice principles, but if you don't um, turn them into practice, then it means very little. But anyway, uh, in response to the uh, question about Internet governance, the role of companies, etc., um, I think we have to be realistic and, and see that in Internet governance uh, discussions now, very little is enshrined to be uh, binding, etc. But in the meantime, a lot of a lot of decisions and practices are done by companies on a daily basis that have a deep impact on people's lives. And similarly, uh, Richard said, well, governments, you know, uh, make decisions, hopefully they're democratic. Well, the fact is that most of them are not, and some of them that were supposed to be are not acting as such. So we have to be very careful also to, to, to watch what we wish for, if you know what I mean. Um, I think that, that you can see kind of a trend of people that seek democratic values in their relation to, for example, the Internet services that they use. So, for example, when Facebook makes a decision, you'll see sometimes users uh, seeking to influence that decision or to change it around or etc. And I think even though it's not effective, it's a hopeful sign that people demand accountability, that they want to see a system of checks and balances in these services that they use on a daily basis. But the question is, how are we going to implement that in practice when we have global companies which have a significant impact on people uh, and when we have governments that are perhaps inadequately uh, performing their tasks or unable to exert any influence over uh, companies that are in different jurisdictions, for example. So we have a real challenge there, and I would suggest that we talk on the basis of principles that we would like to see, and then we look at the different stakeholders that are involved and try to influence them in many ways, and not just through multi-stakeholder models, which indeed have a lot of flaws. And I agree with you that there are fundamental interests, public interests, um, core responsibilities of governments that companies should not even get close to, in fact, uh, where governments often have to check on the companies to ensure that they don't overstep uh, the legal boundaries, etc. But how to do that is precisely the challenge that we're facing right now. Uh, and I'm sure you all know the examples uh, of, of why that is difficult. But it's not even a given that these are the kinds of norms that we're seeking. I mean, it's easy to agree in this room, but let us, by all means, enlarge the bubble of influence. Uh, you know, there, there will be many more audiences where you all me, are in a minority of believing that this is where the discussion should be. There are many audiences where I'm thinking about the foreign, foreign policy uh, circles that I know, you know a little bit from my work, where the role of technology is not understood at all, where there's just the beginning of a discussion about cybersecurity. Well, and I think it would give you the chills if you would listen to what kind of discussions are held there. So let's look at... at what we're seeking, who is needed for that, and enlarge the space within which we're influential, not talk to each other, but talk to uh, our adversaries or those who don't know exactly what we think uh, should be known. Thank you. And Ms. Linda. Thank you. 
Well, I agree very much with the last question that, um, indeed, this is permutating a lot of uh, aspects of our lives. So it's actually a horizontal issue. It's not a, a, a niche issue anymore. I mean, that's very, very clear. And that's why we need to look at this model as it stands now and see what we can do to make it work better. We think that this should, work should be made on the basis of a number of principles, and accountability, transparency, resilience, democracy are among them. So that, that, I think, is very, very important. And it's also clear, I mean, much put it very well, that, that governments do have a role, and, and they are perhaps different from other stakeholders in this area because they have a, a, a public duty to, to protect um, its citizens, to, to defend its citizens, to, 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 to make laws that are reasonable, uh, at least that goes for democratic countries. So that, that is very clear to us as well, that this is part of the redefinition that we need. In, in this work now that we go forward, and that will not be finished with Sao Paulo, that's for sure. It's just, you know, starting off this, this process, um, looking to the future. So, so um, I, I just wanted to, to say that. And one other point as well, uh, what we need for a truly multi-stakeholder model to work is to bring in parties that are perhaps not so active right now because it takes a lot of resources. I mean, you all know it's it's... It's going on in a lot of places at the same time. It's very hard to follow what's, what's going on. And so we need to invest in capacity building. And I think that Europe should invest in capacity building in, in developing countries so that they can really participate. We will make our own small contribution to this with the Global Policy Internet Observatory. We are now doing the feasibility study for that. And we hope to have it up and running end of this year, beginning of next year. And this platform should be a hub where you would have all the agendas, you would have all the papers that are, are circulating out there, so it would be easy to, to see what, what is this, the latest uh, state of play. It would also be very technologically, we hope, uh, uh, good, so that you could, for instance, prepare your own presentations on Internet governance, as an example. And I want to say, we had the idea, we're going to put it out there, but we don't want to keep ownership of it. It's not supposed to be a European platform, and much less a European Commission platform. It should be global. We already have quite a number of partners from around the world in this uh, venture, but we, we, we actually do not want to keep it. Once it's done, it will be put out there. And the last question. Hi. Um, my question, I guess, is to Maricha. But, um, um, yeah, so I think it's really strange, this notion of rebuilding trust. So I've been working a lot on this NSA surveillance-related stuff and for more than a decade on the issue of mass surveillance and targeted surveillance. And... Um, I feel like the trust isn't just lost with regard to the NSA, right? It's not just about the NSA. It's also about the Syrian electronic army. It's about the Chinese, the Iranians. It's about me in this room with your laptop, right? And so um, my question is, what will politicians do to regain my trust? Because as far as I can tell, no European or American politician has said that they want to end so-called lawful interception that puts everyone at risk so that some people may someday be wiretapped well knowing that there are these positive and negative obligations that states have to protect people from mass surveillance. So when will a European politician say, no more unencrypted phone calls, we want to have perfect forward secrecy, the cryptographic key should be in the hands of the users only, right? These kinds of things. I mean, we don't need to restore trust in the NSA. I never trusted a bunch of fucking spies in the first place, right? <laughs> we need to... We need to be able to trust that states will actually work to protect citizens against the interests of an absolute state. I mean, that's one of the great things about Europe, I thought, and the Council of Europe and the European Parliament was the notion that states are not absolute in their powers and that they make mistakes and we should be able to right those mistakes without losing our lives. So when will that happen? When will we see end-to-end -end encryption, you know, fundamentally secure systems being deployed instead of hoping that we can trust a bunch of lying spies, which will never happen. We should never trust them, and we should not stay weak in that, I think. Um, 
No, just, just to clarify, um, my comment about restoring trust was in a sort of broad sense of the alliance, which was, you know, worth also something quite fundamental for people in this continent. I mean, if we look at history, it tells us a lot about how we respond to these NSA revelations. Um, there are many people now in leadership positions politically who primarily see the U.S. as liberators. Because that was really, you know, with, you know, mostly men and boys' lives, quite a real thing that allowed for a free Europe to even emerge. Um, and so when I spoke about restoring trust, I was talking about the broader notion of an alliance, which I think the Americans have not done justice to uh, by treating our citizens the way they have with these systems uh, and by um, creating this kind of dependence um, and, and a lack of um, oversight and transparency to even make that a conscious decision on the part of our politicians. I mean, we can, we as people's representatives can hold governments to account, for example, or at least uh, the European Commission, etc. But if we don't know, and this is of course one of the main problems what, that have come to the surface, if there are secret decisions that nobody can ever access, then this whole notion of accountability is gone. So I think, of course, there, there are technical options to, um, uh, to regain uh, trust, if you want to call it that, but, but there is the reality of uh, geopolitics, there is the reality of, of political leadership, of democracy and how it can be improved. And, and I care too much about the promise of democracy to simply look at technical solutions to say that's the only way to regain trust. I'm not saying it shouldn't be an integral part of our thinking, but I also think we have to come back to the core principles of what a democracy should be and try to fix it. We cannot just throw it by the wayside and say, oh, we'll just encrypt everything and then we're done, because I don't think that will be enough. Um, but about the standards, it is something that I have discussed, because as you probably are aware of the uh, ETSI, the uh, Telco um, Standardization Body, or yeah, that's what it's called, the Telecom Standardization Body uh, in Europe, requires lawful intercept capacities. It's like actually demanded from uh, those who build networks, etc., because our laws should allow police and others in the context of the rule of law to access um, conversations, for example, between criminals or whatever after a court order, etc., etc. Isn't that exactly the problem, though, that you guys thought that you could control the spying in a sense? And now what we found is that every time you chose so-called lawful interception, what we found out is that the NSA wins and they don't care at all about due process or European law? No, and I mean, I, yeah, no, and I guess my point is the question is uh, whether or not these processes should also be fixed uh, because the idea that there should be oversight and that that should protect people from the state is also very much embedded in who we are as Europeans. That's why you will see in countries like Germany who have a recent memory of Stasi uh, and its practices that the protection of the individual from the state is much more lived, I would say, by many Europeans than it is by uh, many others, including Americans. Um, but, but I think that there should be um, uh, solutions on both sides technical sides and on the democratic rule of law side. Uh, and I'm at least not willing uh, to give up uh, on the rule of law side, but I'm happy to talk further about what you think is feasible because as soon as you get into the encrypt everything discussions, uh, there will be also quite legitimate questions about what it means for law enforcement the way it's organized right now. And we have to look at what is actually feasible within the context of the law. Uh, and the technical uh, possibilities to protect people. And that goal we share 100%. Uh, I'm sorry, we don't have more time for questions. We already got uh, at least a quarter of an hour late. But uh, uh, I just want to uh, say one closing word, for, uh, maybe for, a for end. Uh, people in Western Europe um, maybe didn't ask these questions that you mentioned so, mu so much about who, sh who will protect us from our own protectors, mm -hmm. as did the people in uh, Eastern Europe, yeah. Eastern Germany, and so on. So we don't have, uh, I'm from Croatia, uh, maybe we don't have so much fear from the criminal, from the unsecure system of national governance as we do from our own state because of our memories of the past. Mm -hmm. So maybe some experience could be shared in this, since, since we see that nothing is secure in the internet anymore, and Surveillance is possible from all, from all sides, but I, I want to ask everybody to consider one thing. 
What would you think? What would happen if the same scandal with NSA would be, but from other sides, from the Russia, from China, and so on? How, will, how would the European Union institutions react to that? Imagine. Uh, thank you for, the, for your focus. Thank you for your uh, questions. And I would like to close the Internet Governance meeting today. Thank you all. <laughs>